we've got people from all over the country and from uh, internationally as well, which is exciting. Um, so welcome again to everybody. And um, we're going to get started. I just want to talk about a couple of things first. Um, everybody should have the files for the presentation today. There's a PDF file and there's an Excel file. You should have those in your REFM account in your order history at this point. So um, if you have not gone back into your account to do that, go ahead and do that now and you can download the files. You don't necessarily need to download the slides because you're going to see the slides on your screen, uh, but the Excel, you'll, you'll probably want to have that open uh, while, we, while we go through the presentation so that you can look into the formulas and the cells and, and make sure that you understand everything that's going on. That said, um, you should situate uh, the, the go-to meeting, go-to webinar viewer window, maybe on you know a third or half of your screen area and, and leave the other half for uh, the Excel sheet so that you can have both open simultaneously. So go ahead and, and get a setup that works for you. Um, and um, then we'll get started just with respect to format we are going to hold questions until the end. So um, please, if you have a question, uh, I do want to answer it. Uh, just write it down so that when, when we're done with the presentation, you can send it through and, and we can discuss it. All right. Well, thanks again for attending. And let's start with the slides. Today's topic is truly understanding cap rates. A little plug for REFM, since this is a free session and this information is valuable. We do everything that you see here and uh, that you see on our website. Please check it out. We've got lots of great tools, free tools and then also tools for purchase. We are offering a promotion through the webinar today. Um, we have another five or six training classes going on this month. We are really firing on all cylinders here. Uh, there's a lot of demand out there for training. So um, we're offering 25% off using the coupon code that you see at the top here. So go ahead and write that down. Take advantage of that. We've got um, training offerings every week of this month and every week of every month. So um, nonetheless, this coupon is only good for June. So uh, if you are looking to beef up your skills a little bit, go ahead and uh, take advantage of that nice discount. All right, on to business. So the question that we need to answer first of all is, well, what is a real estate cap rate? Cap is short for the word capitalization. And what a cap rate is, is simply a percentage, okay, that is derived through dividing one number by another number. It's, it's just algebra. But what it reflects in a real estate context is the desirability of a particular type of cash flows, okay? So this is really what we're going to be talking about and naturally there's the math behind it, but when we talk about cap rates, what we're really talking about is how does the real estate market view a stream of cash flows from an apartment building that's class A? How does it view a stream of cash flows from an office building that's class B in a, in a tier two city and so on? And so those are, the, those are the types of things that, that we're really talking about is how, how are those cash flows valued relative to other investment opportunities, okay, other investment opportunities within real estate and then also outside of real estate. And so the math behind this is very straightforward. Uh, essentially, the way we derive or calculate the cap rate is by taking the next year's stabilized adjusted net operating income, okay, and when we say stabilized, what we're referring to is um, flat in nature or growing relatively smoothly over time, meaning we're not looking at the lease up of an asset and it's only 60% leased and at the end of next year it's going to be 80% leased. We're talking about an existing asset, let's say, that is already 90% leased and has been 90% leased for at least three or four months, okay? And so we're going to look forward in time from the present to the next year's amount and 
simply divide that annual net operating income, which is on an adjusted basis, which we'll look at in detail in a, in a second, divide that by the purchase price that is being paid or being offered for the acquisition of the asset. Okay, it's very simple. That's it. That's what the cap rate is. It's the resulting percentage. Okay. Um, so when we say or hear an eight cap, what we're hearing is that an eight cap is a property that has a cap rate of 8%, right? Which means that if we were to do the math of putting next year's adjusted NOI over the purchase price, the mathematical result will be 8%, right? So the, the income is 8% of the purchase price paid. And so what we're also going to see is that any percentage that we talk about when we talk about cap rates is also equivalent to a, a multiple, right? Because the multiple and the percentage are essentially just reciprocals of one another. Okay, so let's go now to the Excel. So let's switch over to the Excel if you want. I, I recommend that you do because I think it's a better learning experience that way. And let's look at our first tab, which is the uh, sample cash flow statement. I'm just going to bring this over a little bit. And this is um, a sample statement that comes from uh, the uh, Linneman Real Estate Finance Risks and Opportunities textbook. Okay, and I'm not going to get into this in, in great detail, but basically I, I just want to stress that um, the number that needs to be used or uh, is typically used when discussing and deriving and calculating cap rates is the adjusted NOI number, not just the NOI number. So the NOI sits here, right, and this is simply the difference between total income and then total operating expenses. But there is another section down below that we need to take into account, which is other costs, which, let's see if I can do this a little better. Okay. So other costs which are going to reduce the net operating income that are real costs that are incurred in, in the ownership of an asset. And these include the TIs, right, for an office building or an apartment building, leasing commissions, much more prominent in an office property or retail property, and then capital expenditure reserves. And so when we're talking about the difference between NOI and adjusted NOI, these are the elements that are being deducted from NOI. We see our NOI here is 21.6 million, but our adjusted NOI in total ends up being something less than that, 20.5 million. Okay? And so this is a more conservative approach, and this is typically how it is, in fact, done, um, because when we buy an asset, we don't want to fool ourselves that these elements here are not, in fact, a liability to us, because they are a liability to us. Okay? And so let's go to the next tab, which is the cap rate tab, and this is just a simple mathematical explanation of how we calculate the cap rate. Okay, so let's say that we have an office building and this year's adjusted annual net operating income is $1.9 million, and our forecast for next year's NOI on an adjusted basis is $2 million. And let's say that we're going to offer $25 million, or we are the owner and we are offered $25 million for the asset. Well, calculating the cap rate is very simple, right? It's simply that assumed future stabilized NOI divided by the stated purchase price. And so this is my 8% cap rate. Okay, again, it's simply saying this is what we expect the building to earn and this is what we are paying. And so if we look at the next tab, which shows the reciprocal nature of cap rates and the multiple, okay, a 5% cap rate is equivalent to a 20 times multiple, right? is you're simply taking 1 divided by 5%. Likewise, an 8% cap rate, the reciprocal of 8 over 100 is 100 over 8, which is equal to a 
multiple. And so what we're saying here is if we are going to pay, if we're going to buy an asset at an 8 cap, we're essentially paying 12 and a half times that next year's stabilized net operating income. And when we multiply that number, that assumed number, which we said was 2 million by 12.5, that's going to give us our purchase price, which, as we said, was 25 million. Okay? And so let's take a look now at the next tab, which is going to show us the continuum, right? So we don't just have 8% cap rates. We have 9% cap rates and 7% cap rates. And this is really what I want you to, to first understand is the spectrum of cap rates. And so when people talk about cap rates are high or cap rates are low, when they say high, they mean a higher percentage rather than a lower percentage. And what we have seen is that the higher the cap rate, Okay, here's a 12% cap rate, the lower the multiple. And the lower the cap rate, the higher the multiple, right? So if I, if I buy a building at a 4% cap rate, what I'm doing is I'm paying 25 times that estimated next year's adjusted NOI. Okay, and so here are our various prices. This is what we had shown in the model, right? $25 million purchase price as an 8 cap. And if we were to choose a significantly lower cap rate of 4%, we'd, we'd be multiplying this $2 million amount by 25. 2 by 25 is 50 million. Okay, so this is what people mean when they talk about the compression of cap rates, right? And compressing a cap rate means it's becoming smaller, but when, some, when the cap rate becomes smaller, the multiple is becoming higher. So in other words, that cash flow stream is being perceived as more valuable at a lower cap rate than it is perceived at a higher cap rate. Okay? Likewise, we have the concept of multiples expanding. Okay? And this is just the, the, the converse of what we talked about. At a high cap rate, our multiple is lower than it is at a low cap rate, okay? And so you can just take a look on your own at the math that's going on here. We're essentially just applying different multiples to this $2 million NOI. Okay, and so the good news is because we have this relationship, Right? If we know any two of the three elements here, we can always calculate the third. So let's say that we know that the future NOI is going to be $2 million, and we, we buy properties at a 5 cap. Right, And so to get to the purchase price, all I have to do is simply divide the $2 million by the cap rate, okay? and so on. Likewise, if I know what I'm willing to pay in absolute dollars and I know the cap rate, I can back into what the NOI should be, assuming that it's a $25 million purchase price and a 5 cap. Okay, so, and naturally the multiple, if I know the cap rate, I can always calculate the multiple. So, so this is the basic relationship between these things, and once we understand these, the, the rest of it is, is pretty easy to, to, to get your head around. Okay, so let's go back to the slides. And let's just move forward a little bit here. We've covered all of this already. And so when people talk about cap rates, right, we, we have um, a lot of discussion about well, I bought it at a six cap, or I rather the seller says that they sold the property at a six cap, but the buyer says that they bought it at a seven cap, okay? Meaning in the from the buyer's perspective, their first year's NOI divided by the purchase price that they paid will yield them a seven percent NOI yield on cost. Well, 
since the purchase price is what it is, right, and that's the denominator of our cap rate equation, then this discrepancy has to stem from the numerator, which is the NOI. And so when you hear these conflicting reports as to at what price, what did a property trade, okay, you really need to get to, well, how is the numerator being defined here, right? This is, this is really the, the, the crux of the matter is how are you defining net operating income? Okay, is it the stabilized net operating income? Is it next year's net operating income? Is it before or after CapEx, before or after TIs, before or after leasing commissions? And if so, what did you assume for those? Did you assume CapEx of 100000 a year or 250 a year or something else? Okay, did you assume TIs of $30 a foot or $70 a foot? And, and so on for the leasing commission. So really, the purchase price is what it is. Okay, it's going to show up in the tax records. Um, and so the, the variable, in essence, is the numerator, the NOI. So that's what you need to get to is how are, how are these parties that are claiming different things defining the NOI? Because that number is a different number for both. Okay, so what composes a cap rate, though? Well, what we're saying here is we're saying, well, if the cap rate is simply a mathematical result of dividing NOI by the purchase price, well, the purchase price is going to be based off of demand, right? How attractive does the market feel a particular asset is and that's going to be reflected baked into the purchase price that they offer okay and if there's extremely high demand for a particular asset the purchase price is going to get bid up and up and up and so what happens when the purchase price is continually bid up our cap rate calculation since the NOI is essentially remaining static the, the cap rate goes down and so it, it, the lower cap rate is a reflection of how desirable that asset is to those who are bidding on it. And so if we want to take a look at what are the components, though, right, of, of, a, of a cap rate, you know, in theory, the, the, the return that we would expect and target for a real estate asset is going to be relatively higher than that which we would demand of something that has very little or essentially zero risk. And so really when we're taking a look at cap rates, say it's a, an 8% cap rate, contained within that 8% there is going to be essentially some assumption as to, well, what would I get as a return if my investment were to have essentially zero risk and the proxy that is used as the risk free rate is typically the US Treasury bond and you can find the data for these online at the Treasury or any one of the financial websites so that's the base amount okay but we all recognize that real estate does have a lot of risk um, and some properties are significantly more risky than others so layered on top of that risk-free rate will be a aggregation of various items which compose a risk premium. Okay, there's a risk premium on top of the risk-free rate. And that risk premium is going to be driven by the actual asset, the, the subject the property that you're considering buying. So the characteristics of the asset um, with respect to, okay, how, how old is it? Who's the tenant base? What is their credit? Is the tenancy 100% concentrated in a single industry? Or is it more diversified? Okay. Also, it's going to include elements of, well, is there 
good, recent, relevant market data that can give you an idea of what other similarly sophisticated buyers and sellers have traded these properties at. Okay, and so you know, let's say that there were two towers and they were essentially the same, and for whatever reason, um, it's you know, it's it's like a twin tower type of property. For whatever reason, one one of the towers was sold off. The, the owner sold wanted to do it piecemeal. So he sold off Tower A, and Tower B is now on the market, and Tower A traded, you know, three months ago or two months ago. Okay, you couldn't find more, in theory, you couldn't find a better comparable than Tower A if you're looking at buying Tower B. But that said, you need to compare these elements. Well, presumably they're going to be of the same quality because they were built at the same time to the same spec. Presumably they're going to be the same age, right, because they both came to market. Oh, maybe, maybe not, but um, probably very close in, in vintage. The location is the location because they're, they're situated right adjacent to one another. But maybe one of the towers has a tenant mix that's highly concentrated in an industry that you perceive a lot of risk in, and the other one has the U.S. government as a tenant, and they're, and they're, they're the sole tenant. Okay, so those are things that are going to affect how much risk you perceive associated with the particular asset that you're contemplating acquiring. Okay? And then also you need to consider, well, how would other buyers likely price this property? Presumably the bidders for a property are going to be of similar sophistication and similar savvy. And so you need to think about, well, how are the others going to price it, you know, just how desirable, just how much in demand is this asset class, is this particular property, and how, how much appetite do my competitive bidders have? And so that's going to affect the, the cap rate um, as well. Okay, and so when we take all of these items and we can just list them out, we can see how the total cap rate, which we say is, in this case, 7.5%, is essentially composed of these various items. Okay, And so there's a risk-free rate. This is the, the roughly the average for the 10-year Treasury bond you know, uh, in the, the month of June so far. Uh, and then we need to layer on top of that additional percentages, additional amounts premium um, amounts to reflect the various risks and characteristics of the building, such as what's the occupancy, quality, age, location, and, and so on. Now, unfortunately, you can't go to a website to find out what each of these premium amounts should be. These are all subjective, okay? And this is where your business judgment as a real estate investor has to come into play. And this is also where you will look to market data to see what cap rates have been. And you can simply back out, right, the amount that is being applied on top of the risk-free rate because the risk-free rate is a published number. So if we know that Tower A traded at if we know that Tower A traded at a 7.5 cap and the Treasury is at a 1.5 from the 10-year, then we can do the simple math and say, all right, well, there was a 600 basis point or a 6% spread to Treasury that, that was paid, okay, a premium of 6% that was paid by the buyer of Tower A. And so... Let's go back to the Excel now, and now, now let's take a look at the final tab and, and just see how this all works. So we, we've done this top part here. I've just zoomed in a bunch. Um, now, now let's look at the next piece. Okay, so the next piece down here is is really um, well. Let me just show my um, let me show my slides and my Excel at the same time so that you can see both. Okay, the next piece is to essentially come to understand 
that the cap rate, okay, the, this, this resulting percentage is in essence the weighted average of the return that goes to debt and the return that goes to equity, okay? Because if you think about it, cap rate is NOI over purchase price. The NOI pays both the debt service and the equity return, right, on a residual basis after the debt service has been satisfied, the excess goes to equity, okay? So it makes perfect sense, right? So if we just take a look at it, let's say to keep it simple in the first example, we have an interest-only loan, right, and it's an 80% loan to value, and that interest-only loan is 5% interest. And so naturally the balance of the capitalization would be 20%. And let's say that the equity investors were targeting a 15% return. And so we can just take the weighted average of these using the sum product formula, which multiplies the 80% times 5%, and then adds that to 20% times 15%. So that's 4% plus 3% is 7%. Okay? And so we can look into the market and look into data points to see these are the cap rates at which similar properties, properties of a similar profile are trading, and then we can also essentially converge upon that 7% market data point by looking at this. And so maybe, maybe the required return is really 17%, but nonetheless, it's interesting and I think helpful to understand that when we say a 7 cap, it's essentially a blend between, well, what does the, the debt require and what does the equity require? Okay? And so that's a little bit of a, of a more straightforward example. The little bit more complicated one is, well, what if the loan is amortizing? Well, there's a little bit more math that we need to do to get to this answer, but it's essentially the same process. Okay, so let's say that we have an amortizing loan at a 5% annual rate, but we're making um, monthly payments, so our monthly interest rate is um, 0.42% or the 5 divided by the 12, and again it's amortizing, so what we want to come to understand is, well, what is the mortgage constant, or what is what is the amount that we're that we're paying on a monthly basis um, on a loan amount of of one dollar? And I have this this comment here. Um, and so, assuming 360 months or a 30-year loan and a 5% annual rate, this is the mortgage constant which we get to by running this formula here. And so, if this is monthly, then we can multiply it by 12 to get to the annual mortgage constant. And this amount here, okay, is essentially, this is the lender's cap rate, right? This is the lender's cap rate, which is, if we look at it in percentage, is 6.44%. Okay, so while the loan says 5%, it's amortizing. So essentially what the lender is getting paid is 6.4%. Is and so if we take that 6.4% amount and let it flow down here and now look at this same table, right, and let's say it was an 80% loan to value, and again, let's say that our equity requires a 15% return, this weighted average is something slightly different, okay? And so it's not to say that we should have ended up at exactly 7%, okay? This is just to show you that there's different ways of understanding how you essentially build the cap rate and essentially what the cap rate represents, right? And so these are things that you can take a, a look into a little bit more closely on, on your own when you have some more time, okay? And so let's go back to the slides now and, and take a look at a couple more things. And so the question becomes, well, understanding cap rates now is one thing, but how do I project a future cap rate? And so really 
what we're saying is, well, if a cap rate today, right, is some risk-free rate plus a spread on top of that, that reflects risk elements related to the transaction, then really a future cap rate is just a forward estimate of what the, the risk-free rate will be at that point in the future, right? And then once again, the layering on top of that of a spread to reflect the risks in, inherent in the transaction. Okay, and so easier said than done to forecast the treasury bond yield one year from now, two years from now, five years from now, but um, there are futures markets that you can look to and you know if you believe that the markets are inherently efficient or pretty efficient, then you know you can base these elements, you can base your estimate off of those elements. However, okay, just in general, as a building ages, as an asset ages, and it's no longer the, the nicest, newest thing in town, cap rates will tend to expand for that asset, okay? Um, meaning if you bought it at a six cap and you hold it for 20 years, okay, you can't necessarily expect to sell it at a six cap 20 years from now because it's going to be dated at that point. So because it's a little bit older and, and less up to date with respect to its amenities perhaps or the finishes, you will likely have to sell at a somewhat higher cap rate than the cap rate at which you purchased. Okay? And that, again, the cap rate is just the reflection of the desirability of that asset's cash flow stream. Okay? It's, it's, it's a symptom of the nature of the cash flow. Okay? It's like um, having a cold. Okay? You, if you have a cold and you start to cough, Okay, the cough is just a symptom of the nature of the, the bug that you have in your system, right? And so it, the cap rate is really, it's just a, it's just a, a symptom in, the, in that regard. Now that said, property types and locations come in and out of vogue, so to speak. And through the market cycles, you're going to have cap rates adjusting and changing over time based off of how does capital, global capital, view the attractiveness of a particular type of cash flow stream. For instance, here in the Washington, D.C. market, okay, multifamily assets inside the Beltway, which is sort of the closer end suburbs, some of them are still pretty far out in my opinion, um, those have been extremely hot, okay, and, and capital has come in from all over the world because it perceives the safety, stability, and predictability of those cash flow streams, okay. Washington was creating jobs. Most cities weren't. People were migrating here because there was work. And so the apartment buildings were getting filled up, vacancy dropped, and if a large chunk of your tenant base works for the federal government, okay, there's a, where basically no one is ever fired unless there's some major scandal, right? There's, there's a, a very relatively high level of perceived security in the, in the rents that are going to come from those tenants. And so people have been buying uh, apartment buildings, class A apartment buildings in, in DC area you know, at under five cap. So that's, that's like saying you're paying, you know, 20 to 25 times the next year's assumed NOI. And that's, in my humble opinion, very rich. That's a very rich valuation because there is a lot that goes into owning and managing real estate. And if you're only making four to five percent for all of that work, um, it's kind of rough. But it's all relative. Okay, capital is global. Capital chases performance. It doesn't care about anyone or anything. It's simply chasing yield. And so if at the time global capital finds 
multifamily class A cash flow streams to be extremely desirable, then the prices on those properties will get bid up. The NOI is what it is. Therefore, the cap rate comes down. Okay, um, where do we find data on cap rates? Um, well, really, if you think about it, it's wherever sales data exists, right? And so wherever you can find sales data and then uh, hopefully there will be some data relative to the income of the asset, then you can either do the math yourself or sometimes the cap rates will be quoted. Okay, so here are some examples of sources of cap rate data. And, and sometimes just in, the, in your local business journal, they'll, they'll talk about um, the price at which a property traded and, and, and um, what its income was. So you can derive the cap rate in that way. Uh, investment sales brokers, when they put out packages, will often have comps uh, for uh, similar buildings that have traded recently, and they'll show the cap rate at which they, they have traded. Okay, And so there's, there's no real secret to this. Unfortunately, because this data is valuable, most of these sources that you see here charge for access to this data. So, um, But that's the way of the world. Okay, and so... Those are the basics on, on cap rates. I'm, I'm happy to, to field questions now, um, but before you go, I just wanted to remind you of, of the promotion that we have available. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll put this over here, and um, what questions can I answer for you? Let me know. Okay, a, a very good, a very good question from from the phone. Okay, how are cap rates tied to interest rates? Well, they're not necessarily tied to interest rates, but they are, are a reflection of where interest rates sit. Okay, as I said, right, and as we showed, what are the composite elements of a cap rate? Well, it includes a risk-free rate. Okay, this treasury rate is essentially a reflection of how expensive capital is, right? Here's, a, here's the, the least expensive capital out there, right? And then from there, there will be additional levels of risk as you start to uh, get into corporate bonds, right, of various ratings. Okay, the, the more risk that's perceived in the cash flows for those bonds, the higher the coupon, right? And so... It's all intertwined is, is I guess, the, the, the best answer I can give. Um, but, you know, that said, there, there is, a, there is a, an, an order, which is a natural order, which is to say, if I could get, right, 6% on a U.S. Treasury and the market was paying 5%, was buying apartment buildings at five, at five caps, that does, just doesn't make any sense. You're going to go buy an apartment building, put equity at stake, and then and then go through all the headaches of owning and managing it just for 5% when you could put your money in treasuries and go to the beach and make 6%. Okay, so there is going to be just a natural order that is uh, observed. Okay, did that help to answer the question? Okay, great. Um, questions about how do we uh, get a copy of the event. Uh, we'll make a replay available, the slides and the Excel. We're going to put it up on the blog, um, and it'll, it's just free, so um, you'll, you'll have access to it. will have it up by the end of the week, most likely. Another question is, um, where can I get information on required equity yields? Well, that's a market metric. So required equity yields for what? For a development project in a city that is in dire straits or buying a single tenant office building in 
Washington, D.C. that has the, the federal government as the tenant. Okay? So you need, to, you need to understand exactly what you're talking about in terms of, well, what's the nature of the risk in the cash flows? Okay? Those are sort of the, the two ends of the spectrum. Okay? Buying, let's say you could buy the building with a treasury, right, or the Department of Defense. Let's say you could buy the Pentagon, right? And you could own the Pentagon, and then that's very, very stable. And then on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, you could do, you know, a um, you know three million square foot mixed use project that's heavy on hotel and retail in Detroit, right? And that's quite risky. So the the returns that are going to be demanded by equity, targeted and demanded by equity, are going to vary wildly between those two ends of the spectrum. Generally speaking, if you want a very broad brush, non-committal, vague answer, um, when people underwrite a development transaction, okay, if it's not something crazy like the Detroit project that I just conjured up in my head, um, you know, 20 to 5 to 30 percent internal rate of return to the equity, naturally it's, it's, it's going to be affected by how much debt you're able to get on the project how long the project takes, how long it takes to get your capital back. So it's, it's generally speaking, though, you know, maybe, maybe you want a, a, an 8% return for um, something more stable, something that has a value-add component. You want a 10% return. You're going to go development. You're, you're going to want 20 and up. What other questions can I answer? Let's see here. All right, question is, <clears throat> can you comment on the relationship between how institutional investors look at cap rates compared to a local developer who has pockets that are not as deep. Well, first of all, I think the, 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 the first element is that, you know, the institutional investor, the California teacher's pension, is probably going to be looking at something a little bit differently than the, um, the younger, smaller, local developer, right, who's maybe going to be doing a 20-unit apartment building and, um, you know, CalSTRS is going to look to buy a 1,000-unit complex. So. You know, it's 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 um. There is there is a, a qualitative issue that you need to consider first there. But I mean, generally speaking, I, I think that again, the cap rate is is going to simply be a reflection of how much demand is there for that asset, right? And so, um, it's you know it, it's just it's just math. It's just a numerator and a denominator. So. You're going to want to know whether you're a big guy or a small guy. You're going to want to know what have other people paid, right? How did these things trade recently? Okay, are the are, are the people who bought and sold the, those properties, those comps, are they sophisticated on both ends, right? And so, um, you know, I, I I guess I, I guess I don't in, in conclusion in my long-windedness, I don't know that they look at them very differently, um, even though they are looking at different types of assets and perhaps quality of assets. Again, the way I like to think about the cap rate is just it's just a symptom, right, of how valuable people, how attractive people deem that type of cash flow stream to be. All right. Question is, do you normalize the tenant improvements and commissions to get the cap rate? What if there was a big lease rolling next year? Okay, it's a great question. Um, and so, you know, this is one of the, the elements of risk. And, you know, to, to um, I guess you can play it either way. I mean, if, if, I'm, if I'm on the sell side, I'm marketing the building or I'm the seller, um, obviously, I don't want that big lease roll that's happening next year to 
determine the overall long-term valuation and worth of the asset. And so, you know, I guess you could say, well, let's wait until they renew or we re-tenant their space. Or um, you can just normalize it. But that said, what you put on the spreadsheet is not necessarily what the buyer is going to agree with, right? Any numbers that you present are going to be taken with a grain of salt from the buy side. Um, and they'll say, well, that's very nice that you know how to do, you know, a, a, a straight line allocation of, of uh, you know, millions of dollars in leasing commission. That's, we're glad that you can do that simple math. Um, but, you know, we've got, a, we've got a real big question mark here with respect to this asset. And so their bid, when they, when they submit a bid to purchase the asset, will reflect that, that uncertainty. And as, as will their competitor bids, right? I mean, nobody, nobody who's sophisticated is, is lost on the fact that, you know, 20% of the building occupancy might evaporate, right, in the near term. Okay, um, next question. In deriving the adjusted NOI in the direct cap example, how do you estimate the TIs, leasing commissions, and CAPEX? Well, I mean, if you're the, if you're the owner of the asset, right, um, and let's say you've owned it for, oops, let's say you've owned it for five years, ten years, um, these numbers here are going to be based off of your actual knowledge of the property uh, when major events um, are, are due to occur. And, and, and an example of that is, right, um, let's say that, you know, we know that in year two here, right, the boiler system needs to be replaced, right? Whereas, or, or let's say that in the, in, in the next three years, we've got to do the roof one year, then the boiler, and then, you know, something else with the structure, maybe. And then after that, it basically calms down. So, you know, all of these, all of these numbers are going to be informed by reality. And when you're on the buy side looking to acquire an asset, all of that is going to be part of the due diligence process, right? You're, you're, you're going to have your engineering guys crawling all over the building and asking all of the pertinent questions with respect to, When's the last time you replaced the boiler? How often is it being serviced? When's the last time you resurfaced the roof? And have you had any structural issues? Are there, are there any foundation issues? And so on and so forth. Okay? And so those things, these elements here, are going to um, really be a reflection of the business reality of operating the building. You know, that said, is it, is it better to maybe do some of this big work before you market the asset, well, I would say, I would say, if, if you think that it's going to, uh, that the market will hold up right long enough, such that you know the lack of this big amount, which will then flow into the next year's NOI, is going to um, more than outstrip the dollars that you spend, which it inevitably will, uh, as long as cap rates don't do something silly, right? Um, then it's worth it. It's worth it to wait, get it done, and then bring it to market. All right, I've got some other questions here. Let me just take a second to read them. All right, so here's, here's a question that says, how does a cap rate differ? Or how do you calculate value when you're paying on the anticipation of future cash flows, right? For example, uh, you have a 2 million square foot office building, a mega building that's 50% vacant, but your worldview supports the assertion that demand is going to skyrocket over the next year to whatever whatever the, the factor or combination of factors may be. Well, I mean, you, you're going to have to, you're going to have to pay something that the seller finds reasonable, right? You can't just come in with something totally out of bounds because they're, they're just going to, they're going to throw out your bid and they're not going to take you seriously, you know, 
any any further going forward. So you know you have you have to be within a, a certain band of reasonability. Um, you know that said, this assumption that you're going to be able to absorb a million square feet unless there's something really odd happening. You know, that needs to be reflected in, your, in, in the discount rate that, that you pay, right? So, again, you're going to have to come in, you're going to have to come in with something on the, on the valuation side that's reasonable, um, but you need to make sure that, you know, should this not pan out, that you are, you know, you're pricing it appropriately. So they really kind of, you know, th there's going to be a tension there as to what you feel you should pay and what what the calc what the cap rate ends up being like if if you think that it's so risky that you're gonna you're gonna pay something slightly less right or significantly less and the cap rate goes up to like a fifteen percent cap rate the sellers you know if that's if that no one else is offering anywhere near that you, know, you don't have much of a chance of getting the building. Um, there was a there was a follow up question here, which I'm not sure that I'm, I'm still not sure that I'm um, entirely understanding it. Um, pertains to how you derive a pro forma one year figure for those for these elements. Well, I mean, typically, if you're just for these elements here, you know, the the, the elements below the NOI line, um, you, you'll you'll have an understanding just from the historical operating data that you have on the property. So if you know that over the last 10 years, when you held the property, you have spent on average, you know, let's say 50 cents a square foot or a dollar a square foot, then you can use that same unit measurement to apply to you know, the next year. Um, now, naturally, that's going to smooth out all of the, the bumps that really exist from a cash flow perspective, right? These these are the spikes here, you see here. Um, but, you know, you, you, you simply use some unit measurement and then multiply that by the square footage. And, and then when the seller looks at it, they, they'll probably make some adjustments to it. Does that answer the question more fully? Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad I was able to, to answer that properly. Okay, another question. Can you provide guidance regarding how to develop a cap rate when the property's occupancy is less than 90% or under development? Um, and that's actually very similar to the question that, that we just that we just discussed. So whether it's an existing asset that has a ton of vacancy or an asset that's still being um, developed, I mean, it's you're, you're, again, it, it's going to be in your selection of a cap rate is going to be informed by the climate in the market and by comparable sales that have occurred in the past. And so nonetheless, if you're doing a, 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 a development pro forma, you're going to have some assumption for the exit, right, for the disposition. When you sell the asset, you're going to assume, well, we're going to sell at a six cap. Okay, well, that's fine, but you're also going to run sensitivity analyses around that variable. A six cap is a variable amount. You don't know that the market's going to pay six, a six cap for your asset five years from now when, when it's finally built and stabilized. Maybe they pay seven, maybe they pay eight. So you'll run that calculation over and over at different levels um, to see how the model reacts at those different valuations. <clears throat> All right. Well, we've been going for about an hour here, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna close. Um, but thank you all very much. Great questions, um, and. Um, I hope to uh, see you all back soon. Again, please take advantage of the 
um, promotion that we're offering here, which is a 25% off all of our other webinars that are happening this month. And uh, we, we hope to uh, see you online again. So thank you all very much, and uh, have a great rest of the week.